As part of MIT's Infinite History Project, I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. R. Eric Caulfield, an MIT alumnus and an elected member of MIT's governing board. Eric is the founder and president of the Caulfield Consulting Group, a New Orleans-based management consulting firm. Dr. Caulfield is currently serving his second term on the MIT Corporation, where he is the chair of the Corporation Joint Advisory Committee on Institute-Wide Affairs and has been actively involved with several corporation visiting committees and institute advisory groups. As a student, he was elected president of the Graduate Student Council, and he has since become the only person in the university's history to receive the Alumni National Distinguished Service Award and all three of MIT's highest distinctions for leadership and student life contributions. Dr. Caulfield earned his Bachelor of Science Phi Beta Kappa in Physics and Mathematics from Morehouse College and his Master's and PhD in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from MIT. Thank you for taking the time to talk with us, Eric. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be back on campus. So let's start at the beginning. So tell me about growing up in Louisiana. Oh, I, I am, um, I, I didn't realize exactly how much of who I am comes from the fact that I grew up in South Louisiana. Um, and I didn't realize that until I had a chance to move back to New Orleans uh, about four years ago, um, where having lived away for 18 years uh, outside of Louisiana, I, I expected there to be some sort of culture shock because whenever I would go home to visit, people would always ask me, where are you from? And I'm like, I'm from here. And they're like, no, you ain't. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay, I haven't lived here for a long time. Um, but uh, when I got back home, uh, it was literally just like being a fish, being back in water. It was just very natural. Um, just all the things that I thought were my personality, uniquely to me, it was actually a culture that I grew up in. And so it was good um, uh, to be back. Uh, and so a lot of how I think about and relate to people, um, you know, uh, comes from the fact that I grew up in South Louisiana and that Audrey Caulfield, who's also a South Louisiana woman, raised me to be. So, um, a lot of who I am comes from the fact that I'm a Louisianian. So tell me about Audrey. Uh, she is, you know, without a doubt, the single most influential person in my life. Um, how I think about leadership, how I think about service, um, how I think about people comes from the fact that she was just, uh, just one of the strongest and most compassionate people you could ever meet. Uh, and she raised all of us to be that same way, uh, both deliberately and also just by who she was as a person, how she lived her life, uh, and the fact that we had a chance to see her growing up doing and being who she was. Um, you know, ultimately me going into politics and a lot of what I've done professionally comes from the fact that uh, just my values and, and the way that she raised all of us. Um, and there are, there are many examples that I could give about that. One which I. I think is probably most illustrative is uh, there was a, um, uh, uh, she did home health for a while. She did all kinds of nursing. She was a nurse in hospital. She did private duty for a while. Um, but for part of it, she did home health, which means she was actually going around to see people in their homes. And a lot of these were um, just poor uh, folks in rural South Louisiana, a lot of them. And uh, sometimes I would get a chance to go with her when she'd go see her patients. And one uh, particular uh, time I got to go with her, and we went to see um, uh, this woman, and we're in her living room. I don't know if I was, as a non-medical person I was supposed to be there, but I was. And uh, so she'd done doing all the basic kind of exam things that the nurse is supposed to do. And at that point, in my 17-year-old mind, I'm like, it's time to go, right? I, I have places to be, right? <laughs> um, but instead of uh, leaving, and, and also I was thinking about how my mom got paid as a nurse for the work that she did. And so for every patient she saw, she actually got paid for that person. So you figured she'd want to see more people so she can, you know, you could pay more money. That's how my mind worked at the time. Um, but she wasn't really built that way. And so instead of leaving, um, you know, to go and see somebody else, she, uh, she took out a comb. And she started to comb um, uh, Miss Dantzler's hair was her name. And when she finished, then she started to braid it. And then she sat down and she talked to her some more. How have you been? Uh, how are you doing? Uh, what she realized, and I didn't at that time, uh, was that she was the only person uh, that Ms. Dantzler was going to get to see that whole week uh, because she lived uh, alone like a lot of seniors and people didn't necessarily come by to visit. Um, and so my mom understood that, that um, talking to her was something that was human um, and not just a part of being a nurse. Uh, another thing that was important about that particular moment 
um, was that we were going through very difficult financial times ourselves, right? Literally, we had to go uh, to the food pantry at our church to get free food because we couldn't afford to go and buy groceries. So every moment that we spent in Ms. Danzler's living room uh, was money that was coming out of our household. Uh, but for my mom, and what she understood very clearly was that that act of kindness was more important than making money. And in a real sense, that's the woman who raised me. And so, and she raised all of us that way, uh, both by her example and, and, and intent. So for me, the idea of not being able to help and care about people is just not in my DNA, either genetically or, you know, whether it's, um, uh, and, and the fact that she uh, is my mother is a lot of who, uh, who I would eventually become. So yeah, nurses have, a, their, it's a professional calling. Oh yeah, to, yeah, to it, it really others. is, it really is, it really And is. how many siblings did she uh, help raise? Oh, so it was- She was a single mom. Single mom, uh, it was three of us. I was the baby by far. Um, <laughs> uh, my sister on her 10th birthday uh, was expecting to get a baby doll for her birthday and have a, a great big party. Um, but instead she got a new baby brother. <laughs> I was born on her birthday three weeks early. Uh, I don't think she forgave me for that until I was about 30 years old. But <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about some of the other sources, um, earlier sources yeah. of motivation and inspiration in your life in like, grammar school, high school. Yeah, um, I, I was really, really lucky. Um, you know, at, at growing up, uh, my parents separated when I was very young. Um, but I was lucky enough uh, to have a lot of very positive male figures in my life. Of course, my, my big sister, uh, Sharon, a uh, huge influence in my life. You know, mom was working hard a lot, so a lot of times it was me and Sharon. She uh, did a lot uh, to take care of me. Um, and, and at very important parts of my life, she was always there to, to support and uh, to be in my corner. Uh, but I was also lucky to have my scoutmaster, Curtis Hart, for example. Um, who literally was the first person who taught me about leadership and excellence in, in Boy Scout Troop 98, uh, which we used to meet on the second floor of Allen Chapel Church. Um, and, you know, the idea that you can be as good as anybody as, 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 um, as it was. We started, you know, he was the, the second Scout Master, but he was part of the founding leadership team. And so all of this was brand new to us. Uh, he had a huge impact on my life. Um, you know, there was uh, the, the reverend at my church when I was in high school um, who was very supportive. He helped me out when I was in college at Morehouse. Uh, Lawrence Carter, who was the dean of the chapel at Morehouse. Uh, huge impact on, 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 um, on how I think about academics and its role and how you actually use that to help people. Um, you know, Ike Colbert, uh, who was the dean of graduate students when I was at MIT. Uh, huge uh, impact. I remember standing in the in the in the sandwich line at Laverdi's Market, um, you know, waiting to get. Uh, I think it was uh, eggplant parmesan sub, and and uh, I was thinking about getting involved in GSE at that time in an officer's role. And I remember I came up behind me in the sandwich line. He says, "So, I hear that you're thinking about running for GSC president." And and I was like, well, "Number one, how do you know that?" <laughs> um, but. Also, he was said, I think you should do it. I think you'll do a good job. Mm -hmm. And he was a mentor. He was actually my fellowship advisor um, uh, for the Ford Foundation Fellowship. So I met him early when I got here. And so he was a mentor to me the whole time. Uh, he was there. Uh, he hosted one of the first events I had uh, when I kicked off uh, my campaign for state senate. Uh, and so, you know, over that long period, wow, I just realized how long I've, I've known Ike for almost 17 years. Um, huge, huge impact and um, very supportive. And so. Um, just very lucky to, to have a lot of positive influence. So going back to uh, high school, when did you first develop an interest in, in, in math and science? I, I'm glad you asked me that question. Uh, because one of the people, which I didn't mention, who was seminal um, is um, uh, a man by the name of Jola Bagayoko. Uh, Dr. Bagayoko was a physics professor at Southern University. And um, what happened was I was always, I guess, pretty good at, at science and math. I, I liked it. Um, I was never a very good student of science and math, um, but I liked it. And I think what ends up happening is Mr. Hart, who Mr. Curtis as everybody called him, who's my scout leader, I went to go and talk to him. I was trying to figure out like what high school I was gonna go to because there were two different ones. To, uh, and he was like, so you like, you like science, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, you like math, right? I'm like, yeah. Sounds like you should go to an engineering high school. I'm like, that makes sense, Mr. Curtis, thanks. <laughs> uh, and so that was kind of how I ended up there. But what really the turning point was uh, it was a summer program uh, that we went to um, in the summer between my junior and senior year in high school. 
uh, it was a summer science institute, and, and the reason that I ended up going there was because my best friend at the time, uh, we were sitting in chemistry class, and I looked over at his backpack, and he had this, these papers sticking up. I'm like, hey, what, what's that? And he said, well, it's, you know, it's an application to summer program. I'm like, oh, that sounds like fun. You have, you have fun with that, right? He's like, they pay you $1,000 for the summer. Uh, and when you're you know, 16, 17 years old, $1,000 is a lot of money. Uh, you know, and so I was like, oh, can I, you know, and so I got it and applied. And so on the first day of the program, or certainly the, one of the, uh, the first days, Dr. Bagayoko, who was the head of it, took us into his office. And he looked us right in the eye and he said something which changed the entire course of my life. This, if, if there is a, if there are defining moments um, in, a, in, 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 in what happens to you and who you are, this was one of them. Uh, he looked uh, us right in, in the face and he said, if you can master physics, you can rule the world, <laughs> right? And that changed everything. Mm -hmm. It changed everything. Because what I heard from that, uh, and he went on to say that it, regardless of whatever you want to do, if you can do well in physics, then whether you stay with it or not, you can go into anything you want. And what, what I heard from him and what changed all of it was, number one, that I could be good at school, right? That never occurred to me. Um, and not only that I, could I be good at it, but that this was the path to whatever it was. And I wanted to be able to take care of my family better um, when I got older, to take care of my mom, because uh, she worked hard. Um, wanted to be able to have opportunities for myself, right? And also for all the little cousins um, of mine that I had who were gonna come behind me, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was you know, more nascent, but later on that would become a big driving thing. But it was that moment, literally, that I said, I'm gonna be serious about school, because there was a lot of things that were happening at that time, uh, personally in my life. And so that just foundational changed everything, because when I then went to senior year and started, then school was important, and it had a purpose. Um, and so from that one instance, uh, that one conversation with Dr. Bagayoko, it, it changed everything. I ended up majoring in physics at Morehouse because of that conversation. Um, eventually would end up going in, he wrote my letters of recommendation to MIT um, and to a summer program at Lincoln Lab. Um, again, uh, and, and because of, of that, that, that changed everything. Um, even though obviously I didn't stay in science, as he said, that foundation allowed me to, to have some experiences that I couldn't have even imagined um, when I was sitting in the chair talking to him as a 17 year old. And that you were also uh, first generation from your family to go to University. Well, so. yeah, the first one, first of my mother's children to finish. Yeah, yeah. and my, my sister would eventually go back to school, and, and she got a, a a degree as well. But I was uh, at that time I was the first person to finish. So talk, well, tell me a little bit about the journey, uh, the thought process that that led to you studying at Morehouse. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, so after that summer, um, again, uh, my, my my good friend uh, Weldon, um, he had always wanted to go to Morehouse, so he did for a long time. Um, I didn't really know, honestly, it's sad to say, what Morehouse was really about. I just knew it was a good school and that African-American men went there. Um, Alma mater of Martin uh, Luther King yeah, Jr. Yeah, Martin Luther King Jr., Martin Luther King Sr., um, you know, Spike Lee, a whole bunch of people went there, but I didn't, you know, uh, Weldon knew this, I did. And so he was going to Morehouse. And so after the summer program and I had gotten kind of serious about school, I still wasn't good at it, at least in my estimation. Um, you know, I was like, well, I want to go to a place where, you know, where the, you know, where, where, where people go uh, who are serious about school. And, and, and this place had a mission-oriented thing I found out later. Uh, but I had, the, the question that I had was really how good, it's, how good could I be academically? Because I didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to go to a place where, you know, where that was a good school where we'd be challenged. Um, and that was a good place uh, for African Americans to develop. That much I did know. And... Uh, and so when I got there, uh, it was just a tremendously supportive place. Uh, like I said, I had a lot of mentors when I was there, um, and the place was just so supportive uh, that really laid the foundation for, uh, for coming to, to, to MIT. And in that context, every, everything is about the mission and service, right? So whether you study physics, whether you study uh, math, which I did, um, it doesn't matter because underneath all of it is how do you make uh, things better for people in the African American community, the country writ large in the world, right? And so that's the that's the foundation of what the place uh, teaches you. And I wanted to get that from there, and I did. Um, and so Morehouse's uh, foundation is very similar to MIT's oh, yeah. in that way. Yeah, in that way. And 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 that was 
uh, actually a surprise when I got here because that wasn't something I anticipated finding um, at MIT. I, I just didn't. I, that wasn't. That was. They didn't even. In, 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 mm. The calculus mm. of coming here didn't even. It didn't include that oh. at all. Um, and it was very. I was very excited when I got here and, and kind of discovered it along the way because Morehouse advertises it that way. It's history. It's culture. Is that. Okay. But when I got uh, to MIT, I, you know, my full intention was well, I'm going to go and get a good technical education, um, I'm going to get beat up academically and I'll become tougher bef because of it and then that'll be kind mm. of uh, what the experience I'll take from it. Um, I was excited that they did medical um, applications of electrical mm -hmm. engineering. Right. That was the, you know, the service part of it was how do you help people with this engineering thing. Mm. Uh, but the idea that, that MIT, that <laughs> Uh, that it's all about how do we make the world a better place and, and in many ways train and equip people to do that. It's just, I couldn't have anticipated that before I got Interesting. here. Interesting. Now, I would have thought, given the trajectory that your career took, that that, that was very deliberate, that, you know, um, but, well, but, but yeah. it was a... a yeah, I, I didn't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, I, I, you know, for me, I'm like, oh, MIT does medical research on, so that's good. That's a way you can be of service. That's how you can help people. Um, but the idea of, of you know, kind of regardless of of what path you want to take, that MIT prepares you to, in some sense, run as fast as your legs will carry you. Um, and that meant a lot to me because, you know, in, in, in kind of discovering uh, what my ultimate kind of path would be, uh, just the support that I got was, it was overwhelming in a lot of ways, in a good way. Right. So um, did, um, did you have a career, an academic career trajectory in mind, or were you just taking it one step at a time? Uh, I think, you know, the idea um, in some sense uh, when I got here was that, you know, I would finish my PhD in electrical engineering. Oh, wh when, when did um, MIT come across your radar? When, oh, you, when you were at Morehouse? I mean, yeah. how, did, wh how did you go from Morehouse to, yeah, it, to it, MIT? Li literally what happened was um, the summer after my freshman year, I went back and was uh, kind of a counselor for the same summer program that I'd come through my junior year in, in Dr. Bagayoko's program. And uh, I must have heard about Lincoln Lab from him. He was like, you should apply to this program at MIT. I'm like, MIT? Um, he said, yeah, yeah. Um, do you know this one guy who I went to high school where we were classmates? He said he went there last summer and he did very well. Um, so you should consider you going there. And I'm like, MIT and so he's like yeah so he wrote me a recommendation uh, and I'm, I'm really happy that the guy who went before me um, uh, did because he did well and Dr. Bagayoko wrote in the letter so I'm told um, this student uh, Eric Caulfield is uh, as good as this other guy and I never thought that because that, right. he was a really good student and I was not right. Right. Um, and so I got a chance to come and spend I think we stayed in uh, and Bert and Connor, uh, mm -hmm. those two. And so that was the first time in New England for an extended period. Um, I visited on like a, a week trip, but never stayed on campus. So we were here for the summer. So it was a complete new thing for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what I found out is through Lincoln Lab, if you apply, if you did two summers, that helped you get into graduate school. And so it was at that point that I was like, well, maybe I could go to MIT for grad school. Um, and again, there were two students from my high school that had gone to MIT, they were twins the year before I got to my high school. That was the only thing that I knew about. I never knew anybody who went, uh, but it was really through Dr. Bagayoko saying I should apply to this program, um, and then coming and staying on campus and, and kind of getting a sense that maybe this could, this could actually be something I could do. Um, and then by the time I got to my senior year, I was, it was kind of a toss up between here and uh, Stanford. Oh, um, okay. Had, and you applied, you applied to both? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, after just kind of looking at MIT's program on the medical side, uh, literally, I was like, there's, there's no other place that I could, could be. And then also, you know, MIT was generous enough to, to help with the fellowship, which, you know, helped pay for the first year. So. Terrific. So you said earlier that you weren't that good a student, but yet you, were, you had some drive and motivation um, to become, to graduate Phi Beta, Phi Beta Kappa from Morehouse. Well, so I think you're a little modest here. Well, I would say the way the thing that I always like to that I think about is uh, I, I, the only time I only got I always think about like many other students I say who are better students than me because they got straight A's or close to it for years and years and years. Right. I only got straight A's one time in my entire academic career 
Uh, and that was when I was a grad student at MIT and I took one class. <laughs> so uh, when I say I was, I was a better than average student, but you know, I would say I was a good student if I got straight A's there. Well, MIT's pleased that you came to here and not to Stanford. Well, I am too. <laughs> so let's talk about graduate student life at MIT. Tell mm -hmm. me about the transition from an historically black college in Georgia to MIT and to New England. Yeah, that actually was, was one of the, the, the big growing experiences that I had. Uh, growing up in South Louisiana uh, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, and then going to school in Georgia, also still the South, different, uh, but kind of still the South uh, at an HBCU was a, was, was, was a great experience. The transition to New England was, it was, um, it was a growth opportunity. Um, you know, up until the political campaign, uh, getting a PhD from MIT was the hardest thing I'd ever done. And the hardest part of that experience was the first year and a half or so. Um, because the transition, um, you know, number one, uh, switching academic disciplines from physics and math, going into engineering, similar, but there's a change. Uh, changing schools where there's, you know, it's a different culture in terms of academically how that works. Um, that was a uh, change. The idea that in June, for example, you're still wearing sweatshirts in the first part of the day was just, that was, you know, that was obnoxious to me. Uh, and that took a lot of getting used to. It was, re it was actually a very difficult transition. Um, but what I found at the same time was uh, that there were people around um, both informally and formally um, to help with the academics and culturally, right? So there, you know, whether it was going to play cards uh, with other friends of mine uh, in the dormitory on, you know, uh, on some nights, or being able to go to the Office of Minority Education, OME, um, you know, to kind of talk about academics with folks. Uh, and so both in, in a real sense, it was difficult, but at the same time, there were, you know, you know, uh, structures in place that helped with it, uh, which is one of the things that I really appreciated about my experience. I expected it to be hard, um, and it was, uh, but at the same time, you know, you still come out on the other side uh, in uh, stronger for it, um, and that's something that I appreciated about my experience at MIT. Right. So, but looking back now, uh, what in your mind is is unique or special about MIT? I, I think, and I don't know about other. Uh, technical places, but I think um, what's really encapsulated in what what they call nerd pride. Um, there was a sticker, at least it was popular when I was here. You know, people would walk around and have a sticker that says "Nerd Pride." Professor would wear it sometime. Um, and I think just embracing that culture, um, I think, is is unique um, because it's not only just one thing. It, it tends to be, at least my experience, is kind of however or whatever you are, there's going to be a group or a group of people who share that, right? So. You know, you've got, you know, you can like Star Trek, you can dress up as Star Trek. That's true in other places, but, you know, it's unique here. Star Wars, the same thing. Um, you know, if you're interested in ballroom dance, for example, if that's your thing, you can, you'll find folks who would do that. If you're interested in African dance, you can find folks who do that. Um, and so I feel like just, just the diversity of experiences is very, um, in some sense, welcoming for in, in lots of in lots of different ways. Now, again, you know, anytime you have that many kinds of different folks in the place, sometimes their attentions would show up, and they're real, um, some perceived but real in other cases. Uh, but I think just the embracing of it, oftentimes around a kind of science and techie kind of thing, uh, I think is unique. Um, and as a, as a person who is interested in that stuff and like like it, it was you know it was comfortable being here, and at the same time. When I'm interested in other kinds of issues, obviously um, government and policy, um, issues of justice, there was support for that too. So literally, whatever direction you wanted to run in or I wanted to run in, I felt like I was going to have support as fast as my legs could carry me in. So um, that, I think, is powerful about this place. So can you talk about uh, the research you did while at MIT as it relates to MIT's model, Mens et Manos, and to MIT's founding mission to work towards a better society through science, technology, industry, and the arts. Yeah, yeah, and 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 for me, like again, the, one of the reasons why I was really excited about coming to grad school here was exactly that. Uh, for my master's research, uh, I worked in um, uh, a, a lab that was focused on basically creating a microchip that restores uh, uh, some vision to people with certain kinds of blindness. Mm -hmm. And um, it was uh, retinal implant 
uh, project was is kind of the name of the group. And uh, the person um, who was the head of the lab was also my academic advisor, so I got a chance to meet his students. Um, and eventually, after the first ask if I wanted to you know, asked if I wanted to be a part of the group, and I said, well, absolutely, uh, just because I, it was very exciting, um, you know. And so basically I did some research on figuring different ways that you could actually power the device, because the idea is you, you basically put a, a microchip in, you implant it on the retina, uh, and then you have it uh, a camera on the outside, uh, and basically the camera captures the image and then transmits it to the microchip and it stimulates the nerves, and then you can kind of create an image that way. Now, the challenge, the retina is very, very, it's a delicate, uh, it's, a del it's very delicate tissue. And so you don't want to implant something with a battery and then you have to take it out and put it, you know, change the battery, you don't do that. So you have to find a way to communicate with it. Uh, and so I looked at different ways that you could power it without having to take it or remove it. Uh, and then, so that was kind of like the theoretical model that I did for the master's research. Um, and then after that, I switched to do a PhD on focus ultrasound surgery, which is basically using ultrasound to treat um, different uh, I guess, pathological tissue uh, without having to necessarily uh, cut the person open. So the idea is that, say you have a tumor somewhere, you don't want to go in and cut it because you know, the recovery time is longer, the risk of infection is higher. What you can do is you can use ultrasound to zap it inside, and then the body just absorbs it, less infection, less recovery time, um, and also it, you know, it's just a, a more, uh, more effective treatment. And so basically I designed uh, a prototype which used a, a new way of basically creating the ultrasound to, to, uh, to treat them. And so for me, uh, in a real sense, that fundamentally was what it was all about, right? Mm -hmm. How do you help people? Like theoretically, you can have the greatest idea, but if it doesn't change somebody's quality of life, uh, then to me it's not something that I was very interested in. And I was really excited to be able to come to MIT to work exactly on that. Right, and when did, what, when did it uh, hit you? That, uh, that MIT's mission was in fact very similar to Morehouse's. Was there any one thing or did it happen gradually? And I, I think um, one of the things which, which uh, I realized when I started kind of getting involved in student government was, and it was explicit actually, um, uh, it was just before I'd arrived on campus, there was a study that was done uh, which basically created, um, it's kind of like a threefold mission of MIT's uh, thing for its students, uh, academics, research, and community. Uh, and it's that community the part. three-legged stool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, it, and it was explicit, uh, and hearing it, the way that it manifested was the tremendous amount of resources that, that were invested in leadership development, um, in student groups, uh, in places like the GSC and the UA, uh, and also in, in dormitory, uh, GRE, uh, I mean, um, uh, uh, graduate residence, like all kinds of other things that support students in development. Uh, and so that was a very real kind of thing because they wanted students to have that experience. They wanted us to be able to do that. And so um, in some sense, that's kind of the conscious part of it. But then um, as you get involved in student government, then you see other people who are doing that and there's support for them too. Right. So uh, that leads to one of my questions here, that because you, you didn't, during your time at MIT, you assumed many leadership roles in student groups and graduate student government. Um, and what was the motivation there and how did those experiences contribute to your overall education at MIT? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, w one thing that I would say is, uh, I remember my first year as a graduate student, a friend of mine was up, uh, I was going to school at Harvard. And we went, we'd gone to high school together and uh, I found out that she was, I think, one of the officers uh, in the uh, African American Students Association at Harvard. And my mind was completely blown. I was like, I mean, like, that's a big deal, right? Because she, you know, like, how would you even think to, you know, to be, you know, to, to run for that kind of an office at Harvard, right? And so I'm like, this is a big deal. Um, just kind of gives you a sense of, like, what I thought, you know, again, how I was thinking about what my experience was going to be like at MIT. Um, then, uh, a friend of mine, that kind of gave me, well, maybe I could, you know, run for some office here. And so, I think I was the treasurer for the, the Black Graduate Students Association at MIT, and a friend of mine was the co-chair that year. And so, at that point, it became a different thing, and, and they did a, re a lot of uh, great events uh, and activities for African-American students and Afro-Caribbean, people of African descent on campus, uh, which really helped people um, and helped the community, both from an educational standpoint, but also just from a cultural standpoint. And so, 
as part of that, uh, I kind of started to hear about this graduate student council thing. And I was on a dorm government, um, just again, because there were people I knew who did it. And so you just kind of see things like, well, maybe I could do that too. Uh, but what ends up happening is a f me and a good friend of mine got involved in GSC because we like to throw and organize social events. And uh, some of the officers came and said, maybe you guys might be interested in doing orientation, which is basically just organizing a whole bunch of events for students. And uh, we did, and it was great. Uh, it was a, a lot of fun. Um, and it also turns out that that was, <clears throat> it was the uh, most successful graduate student orientation in the history of MIT. Uh, I think we exceeded uh, attendance by like 25% of what had come before. Um, and at that point, people started to ask about being an officer in GSC, potentially running for president. And I was like, I don't know if that's the, you know, am I the right person for that? Um, but I sat and talked to a, a group of my, my best friends, and they said, of course you are, and you should run. Um, and Ike, uh, I later ran into, somehow he got wind of it, um, Ike Colbert, and he thought it was, was a good idea too. Uh, and then so once I ran and was uh, fortunate enough to be elected, it ended up, again, being a very transformative thing because it was during my GSC year um, that I really discovered inside that politics and policy, I didn't know it was called policy at that time, um, but that, that the workings of government was, was what my true calling was. Mm. Yes. Um, and, you know, and it was part of that process that really, um, you know, led to, I guess, the state senate race, which was, you know, many years later. Right. So, it, you know, MIT seems to provide, you know, leadership opportunities, very deliberate in all aspects of, of the MIT educational experience. The, the dorms are, you know, the budgets, the treasuries are managed yeah. by, so talk a little bit about how that leadership development seems to permeate, you yeah. know, all aspects of. Yeah, of in, in, a, in a lot of ways, like, and, and self-governance, and, and that's a term which gets, you know, is, is real on MIT's campus. It's when you, from the moment you, like, uh, as, as you pointed out, uh, in the dorms, there's a whole government and they run it, right? In the undergraduate system, they run the um, room assignment process in a lot of them. Uh, they run the social events that happen. Um, they have all kinds of team sports, uh, which again are run by students. The career fair is run by students. Um, you know, the GSC orientation, uh, you know, which is a, at least at that time, it was more than a quarter million dollars. I'm sure it's probably a half million at this point. Uh, all managed, organized, run, and executed by students. Uh, and when you come into something like that as an 18-year-old undergraduate, um, and you have that responsibility, um, and you have lots of people who are supporting you, and, and, you know, as you develop and get better at it, then you just get very comfortable and you assume, oh yeah, well yes, I can do that, and you know, and, and I can do a good job too, right? And it's kind of the culture of this place em empowers that kind of stuff, and, mm -hmm. and the idea of doing new things is always kind of um, is always supported, uh, and there there are resources for it. Again, whatever direction you're trying to run in, the institute can will support you in doing that, uh, and as as evidenced by the number of student groups that has grown. I mean, it's almost doubled since I was a student here. Um, well, that clearly it clearly spoke to you because uh, your initial career aspirations pointed toward becoming a medical research engineer, uh, and, and, and 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 certainly your degrees in field of study supported that objective. But can you talk about the change in direction your your career trajectory took while you were, while you were at MIT? Yeah, in in an interesting um, uh, in an interesting way, one of the uh, things which also was happening at the same time. Uh, was, you know, there's this whole service aspect and leadership aspect, too. And I grew up in the church. Mom was, you know, we went to church a lot. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, there was, uh, she was the church secretary. So, uh, you know, we went to Sunday school at 9 a.m., 9.30, and then stayed for 11 a.m. service. And, of course, we had to stay afterwards because as a secretary, she was responsible for kind of money. And then on Tuesdays, it was, you know, choir rehearsal. On Wednesday, it was Bible study. We spent a lot of time in church. Um, and so that, the religious part of it was also important to me. And so, you know, in a real sense, that was also something I was wrestling with was leadership in the church context as well. Um, and so I was trying to figure out how you balance that. Uh, but at MIT, what I discovered through student government was you can serve people and solve problems at the same time. Because that's what I was really, because the medical thing was that, right? How do you solve problems and help people? But then there was this broader context for 
issues that were facing people, whether it was housing, whether it was health care, whether it was issues around um, equity and equality. Um, one of the projects we worked on as, as uh, student government uh, uh, through GSC was a, a maternity leave policy for women graduate students. Uh, and that was something which happened during our time. And so while not narrowing it to the medical aspect, there's a larger context where you can solve problems and help people. Mm -hmm. And so for me, what I discovered was that policy Again, I didn't know it was called that at the time, but this whole government thing that we were doing um, around health care as students, around housing as students, paternity leave as students, mm -hmm. that's what I wanted to do. And it was, you know, and MIT made it easy to, to come to that realization. Uh, and then once you've kind of gotten involved in, you know, the, the whole resources of the Institute end up being behind you. I couldn't have run for office in Louisiana if I didn't have the support of this, of not only the MIT alumni network, but my colleagues in the um, corporation, uh, people in, in various groups affiliated um, directly or, or, or loosely with MIT. Like, and, and again, this is something which has continued even after I was a student. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think that that really says something about this place. Again, you know, I'm a kid from South Louisiana. The idea that I would work for the White House one day and, and talk about running for office in Louisiana was foreign to me. Um, but this place made it real mm -hmm. uh, in a way that I just couldn't have anticipated. And, and and, you know, of course, in, in conjunction with Morehouse, too, but, you know, I was here for a long time. Right. Um, and it, it really just, it opens your, it really opened um, a lot of people's eyes well, to, to what's possible. Well, clearly there was a shift, given your yeah. uh, involvement in student government. Yeah. Given. And then your, your mindset of, you know, wanting to make a difference. You yeah. could have taken your training, your, you could have worked for a startup, you could have, uh, you know, been a design engineer, you could have... And, and that, but yet, if you take a look at, and I'd like you to, um, some of these choices that you made uh, leaving, upon leaving MIT, and mm -hmm. how they all uh, basically, how each of those experiences have aligned with your career objectives. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, leaving from MIT, I went and worked at McKinsey for, for two and a half years. Uh, but I focused on public sector, right? Um, and process things around how do you make government and government agencies work better. I did a lot of work in that. Um, and that was deliberate because I knew I wanted to go into government at the point, leaving MIT, I knew it. Uh, but I didn't want to go directly into government because then I would just be the science person, right? And you're, you're doing the engineering thing and so you'll be a technical advisor. And, and So going to McKinsey was deliberate because what it did was it kind of allows you to hit the reset button um, and have a new set of skills which is business and general problem solving. So, and, I, and that was a great experience. Um, glad I did it. Um, after leaving McKinsey, uh, I actually uh, went and worked in city government uh, in Newark, uh, working for, I guess, then Mayor uh, Cory Booker, uh, doing urban policy and a number of different things there. Mm -hmm. So the kind of the business says, uh, problem solving training in a broader context that I learned at McKinsey, I could apply there. But a lot of the discipline um, and the way that I kind of approached uh, the work came from uh, experiences that I had at MIT and Morehouse before. And so in a real way, it was kind of an extension of the same kind of thing, right? Is how do you help people based on what you know at that time mm -hmm. and in the context where you are? And then you kind of learn from that experience. Uh, and then from Newark, I went and did a White House fellowship uh, working at Domestic Policy Council doing urban development in economically distressed areas, right? How do you help uh, low-income people, a lot of whom were like me and my family for periods of time, um, have a shot at this whole American dream thing? So did that, living. and that brought you back to Louisiana? Yeah, yeah. I, ironically, one of the projects that I was working on during my fellowship year was a, a program called Strong City, Strong Communities, which President Obama was developing. It was a pilot program where they send uh, federal staff to be embedded in city governments around the country as a, as, a, as a way of kind of improving how federal work gets done on the ground so that the federal government can not only learn what's working, what's not, but also work side by side with the people who are living with and doing the work every day. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, be asked to, you know, to lead the team in New Orleans. It was 25 of us on the federal side, 25 on the city side, uh, and that was all she wrote. That was all she wrote. Um, it was great being back in, in uh, Louisiana, very exciting uh, to be in New Orleans, uh, which, you know, is a tremendous story to be told um, about, I mean, I, I can't say enough about, and I'm, and I'm going to say my people, um, because I'm in New Orleans, I have no intention of leaving there, um, 
uh, about what it means to be in New Orleans at this time, right? Ten years post Katrina, and just to see the transformation, even that's happened in the last five to ten years, has been astronomical. Uh, it's been amazing, rather. Uh, and then, so that was a two-year assignment, and so when it was up, they asked if I wanted, um, you know, to come back, and I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm home. Um, I've, I've found the place where I'm going to be. Now, how ironic is that? Was this, I mean, was there must have been a, an assignment that you volunteered for? Were you assigned it? I mean, yeah. how, how did that kismet uh, yeah, happen? I, I wanted to, I was trying to get back to Louisiana, because uh, I think once I realized that kind of government was the thing, I knew I wanted to get home as, as quickly as I could, because, they, you know, I love my state, and I felt like there was uh, ways that I could be of service to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was uh, actually looked at some work um, earlier, uh, and then it ended up being not the best uh, time to go. Uh, but when the project came up for the New Orleans team as part of SC2, it was a no-brainer. I was like, of course I'm going, right? Of course. Um, but I was actually a part of a team that went down early to kind of see would it be a good fit for you know, for what the president was trying to do and got a chance to meet all the same folks that I would eventually be working with. Um, and when I came back and you kind of give the report, I was went down as, as kind of the White House representative as part of this team that was, again, kind of doing the opportunity assessment, we called it. Uh, and then afterwards, that was just my only role with New Orleans because I was also uh, looking at two other cities as well uh, that I went and visited um, no, with no intention of staying. That was just my part of my role. Right. But then they asked if I wanted to go to New Orleans, and I was like, yes, thank you, um, you know. And, uh, and modesty may prevent you from talking a little bit about uh, some of the success, <coughs> but, but could you, in fact, just talk a little <coughs> bit about um, the success that I've learned about um, in terms of strong cities, <coughs> strong communities, that initiative? Yeah, that very, um, very excited and, and, and um, in some sense very proud about what we were able to accomplish. Um, one thing that I will say is the city's team, outstanding. Um, that was one of the uh, criterias for the program was to find a good, strong uh, team that was doing good work there. One of the best professional experiences I've ever had uh, was working um, in that partnership. Uh, as part of that work together, uh, the city and the federal team, we created $4 million in construction jobs, and we got a, a, a very important roadways uh, project done. Um, and that, that, that uh, uh, construction problem uh, job, or rather project, had a local hiring preference, which means that people from in and around the community and the state were doing the work uh, themselves. We, and the way that that project got done, which was very interesting, was using uh, a policy pilot program that hadn't been used anywhere else in the country. Um, and it was one that has a flexibility that allows mayors all over the, uh, all over the nation um, uh, to move projects forward in a way that they've never been able to do before was very excited about that. We also helped the city uh, put together its uh, uh, low-income um, safety net access program, so for low-income folks. Um, we also found housing for almost 70 homeless people, again, just by understanding how policies worked. Um, and uh, another thing that we did um, was also uh, some important work uh, around behavioral health as well. Uh, we cut the number of people waiting to get psychiatric care in emergency rooms by 25% in a year. Uh, and all of this we did without a single dime of new funding. Uh, it's literally about how do you make government work better for the people it's supposed to serve. Uh, and at the end of the two-year project, um, I was really happy to be able to say I was a part of that work um, at a time when it really mattered for the city. So uh, it seems that when you, in retrospect, when you look at that, when you look at the steps you made, uh, of course, uh, uh, the next step is a, a, a run for the Senate. Yes. <laughs> but tell me about how that all came about. Yeah, it's, it's, it's you know, so one of the things I learned in, in being in appointed, uh, political appointed offices, you're very close to the politics but not in it. Uh, ultimately what happens is, you know, as an advisor you give your best advice, um, and a lot, sometimes it's project management, so you're actually doing the work and it gets done. Um, but at the end of the day, a lot of the folks who make the laws that impact people's lives day to day are legislators, they're elected officials. And, um, and so being someone who's, you know, <laughs> who, who's not excited about not being in the fight for something that I think is important, um, the seat came open, and when you look at issues around, especially in Louisiana, uh, uh, we are, you know, issues of, of, um, of criminal justice. We have the highest incarceration rate of any state in the country. It saddens me to say it, it's true. Um, around indicators of health, educational attainment, a lot of them are just are, are areas where we could do better. 
Um, and the legislature is where a lot of those decisions get made. The laws that actually, you know, oftentimes will either empower people to be uh, who they are or literally, uh, you know, stymie their dreams from the time they're born. Um, originate in the legislature. And so for me, I'm like, if that's where the laws get made, where the fight is to be made, uh, for me, it, at, there's no way that I could not be a part of that. Um, and even though uh, from talking to people who are very informed uh, and who love and care about me deeply, uh, who have said it's going to be a hard run, it's going to be a hard run, you probably won't win, but we'll go with you mm -hmm. because it's that important. Um, and so for me, that it became, it, there really was no decision to be made. I, I had to go and run. So that ended just uh, a month ago. Yeah, yeah. And tell me about uh, the takeaways from, from that and, and what's next. I, I would imagine that this isn't the last that the voters of Louisiana are going to hear from Eric Caulfield. Yes, yes, indeed they will. Um, so, I mean, the, the biggest thing that I learned is um, that it's almost a sense that, that it was, it was, the importance of it uh, has not been diminished in my mind. Um, the reasons that I ran are still the same. Um, the issues that I, that I care very deeply about, I still care about them. And I'm still convinced that good government matters. Because um, when government gets it wrong, the people suffer. And so for me, uh, I'm going to run again. It's just a matter of what it's going to be. Uh, the irony is um, that uh, there is a seat which is, which I just, it's not a seat. It's more or less a position on the uh, executive committee for kind of the city. Um, in the party, but it's an elected position. The voters uh, actually go to the polls. It's, it's on the same primary as for the presidential uh, primary election in March in oh, Louisiana. Oh, terrific. Uh, and so that um, executive committee position, uh, and there are lots of them in New right. Orleans because we're probably right. a popular city, but um, I've just, you know, literally when I leave um, the studio today, I'm going to, uh, to begin to file my paperwork to submit, oh. and qualifying is this week, so my name will be on the ballot by Friday at 4:30 of this week, and that election will happen in March. Now, it's not a you know it's not a legislative position, um, but it is uh, in my mind uh, a way that I can be of service, uh, you know, in a broader context. And, and that won't be the last race either. Right. I know? would imagine that that will um, build up your resume a bit when you um, try for another office. Well, yeah. it, it'll certainly give me a chance to be to help in in between. That's true. Yes. Yes. C terrific. So. Um, I, I couldn't let this conversation pass. There's still a lot of other things we're going to discuss, but mm. I couldn't let this conversation pass without asking about your um, outstanding oratory skills. Mm. Um, I have been witness to those on several occasions. Um, w were you able to put that talent to good use during the election? Well, I, I, I've been told um, that, I, that I, I give a decent speech. Um, I, I, res I respect highly your opinion, so I'm not going to argue with it. <laughs> um, yeah, we got a chance to, to talk a lot. Um, it, it was, uh, I think, what happened was in the kickoff speech, uh, the, at the kickoff event, um, a few questions had to be answered. Is one, is anybody going to show up to support this campaign? And the second one is, what kind of campaigner is, is you know, is this guy, right? Does I mean, is he, because uh, people knew me as kind of the policy person, right? I was the kind of the White House person, and maybe, the, you know, um, and I had a small business, uh, which I still run. So that's kind of the context. But how is he as a candidate? Um, and I think the speech, uh, which, uh, you know, which I gave with support from my team, there was, you know, they were very helpful in, in helping uh, to kind of uh, refine it. Um, but I think really set a different tone for what the campaign was going to be. Um, and a similar thing happened uh, throughout when they were like, you know, I remember a friend of mine uh, at one of the neighborhood associations. Actually, she wasn't a friend at that time, but I just met her. And, and she, she showed me a, a, a text message she just sent. She's like, hey, Eric Caulfield has a, has a, has a really good stump speech, <laughs> um, which I think helped because uh, I think people were talking about it. And, um, when, when did you develop this knack, Eric? I mean, were you were you standing on a, a soapbox at the age of eight? When did, when did, or was it in church? I mean, where did you develop this knack for, um, for delivering for, for this for public speaking? I th so the beginning of it, I would have to say, is is Sunday school at Allen Chapel Amy Church. Um, we had to, um, you know, each each class, uh, you know, it would kind of rotate around which class would kind of give the summary for the lesson for that morning. Um, and I think that's probably the first time that I remember kind of getting up and talking about stuff and maybe people saying, wow, that was really, you know. 
Um, but I think what really happens is uh, when I was uh, about 17, um, we're actually, yeah, I was 17, uh, I actually uh, accepted a calling into the preaching ministry uh, in the Methodist Church. And so um, I was actually um, in the ministry for uh, about 11 years. That explains something. Yeah, <laughs> about 11 years. And a, lot, a huge part of that was, again, it was the service aspect of how do you help people. And that was part of the, the balance that I was trying to work out, ironically, at MIT was there's the service component through religion. How do you help people, um, to inspire them? How do you uh, empower them to be their best selves? And then how do you also solve problems? Uh, and so in some sense, government and policy is the marriage of the commitment to community that you find in religion, for me, is what I found, uh, and the problem solving of engineering. And you put those together and you end up with government. Right. At least in my mind, that, that's the <coughs> equation that how it works out for me. So I've witnessed and you've made speeches, memorable speeches here, um, MLK Breakfast, uh, Commencement, uh, Charles Vest, uh, um, both his, his send off when he retired and then his uh, memorial service. Um, but, but when you think back, what, 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 what are some of the most memorable speeches? What are a couple of the most memorable speeches you've given? I would probably say there are, th there are three of them. Um, one uh, was the senior um, speech that I gave at Morehouse that the, you know, I was fortunate enough to be selected to give that. Uh, it's the second to, I think it's the, the second or the last um, chapel service, so I got to give that speech. Um, and then, it was a sermon actually, I was a, a reverend at the time. Uh, the other one was commencement at MIT in 2004, uh, which, which, which changed a lot of things, I think. Um, and then uh, Chuck Vest Memorial Service. That, oh, I can't even, I can't even, that was, um, I was humbled to be asked to, to, uh, to speak for Chuck at that. Uh, but also just, I, you know, it just meant a lot to me because uh, he, he had a huge impact. Um, what, what, I didn't mention him specifically in terms of mentors. We didn't spend a lot of time together, um, but he was one of the most supportive people for me when I was here at MIT. Uh, he, after the MLK speech which you gave, uh, he was one of the first people to come up and shake my hand, um, you know, after it was over. He was the president of the university, right? I was just a graduate student who, you know, had just talked for five minutes or whatever it was, and he got up out of his seat to come and talk to me. Um, and, um, you know, and also he wrote one of my letters of recommendation for the White House Fellowship Program. And, you know, he, and when he, you spoke at the 2004 commencement, and he, he said that he was happy <laughs> that this would be the last time that he would have to follow you in a speaking program, so. Yeah, he was, he was, he was very generous um, in that way. Eric, you have a long and impressive track record of contributing your time and talents to any number of committees and boards, including currently serving a second term as a member of MIT's governing board the youngest ever to do so. Tell me about that experience. It's uh, probably, in terms of professional development, is one of the greatest things that ever could have happened. Um, I got lucky when I was uh, serving in GSC when I was a student. Uh, another student told me about this uh, recent graduate um, position on the, on the corporation or the, or the MIT board. I'd never, I didn't know, know about it, um, but he, you know, said, well, you should, you should consider running for it when you graduate. Um, and I did and was fortunate enough to be selected. Um, during that five-year period, just to, to one, to see how leadership and develop and, dis and decisions get made um, at the highest levels. Number one, I loved MIT, right? I love MIT. Uh, and to have a chance to still be a part of, of helping, you know, the place in and of itself was great. But to kind of see how that happens from a governance standpoint um, was awesome. Uh, but also, just from a, a professional development standpoint, one of the committees that you serve on as a recent graduate is the screening committee, which then is, sets up the process for selecting the next recent graduate, at least putting the ballot together so that then the, the students and alumni can select. But just as part of that process, you review hundreds of applications, read hundreds of resumes, dozens of interviews that you're conducting. So what happens is you really get a sense for, you know, how to give an effective presentation, how to write a good essay, how to put together a, a strong resume, so that 
when I left um, uh, McKenzie at that point, every other job that I had was informed by sitting on the other side and now knowing how to do it and think about it um, in a way that I wouldn't have if I hadn't had that experience. But then at the same time, you really get a look at MIT in a way that you wouldn't have otherwise, because then you serve on visiting committees and you get to go and spend two days learning about a department in depth. Or you see what it means to think about uh, whether it's diversity or housing or any number of different issues from a strategic, you know, 10, 15 year uh, kind of look. Uh, it's, I mean, it's just been, it's, I mean, it's been great. And, and, just, and also just being able to stay involved with MIT for 17 years now has just been, been great for me. So tell me about some of the insights you've gained from, from serving on these visiting committees. And anything that was, you know, really fascinating or particularly interesting or something you wouldn't have known about otherwise? Yeah, I think, um, like some of the things that you learn, like student life, for example, right? It, it's interesting uh, as a, coming from a student advocacy background. Again, that was the whole reason why I went into student government was to be able to advocate for the needs of students uh, and to, you know, in some sense, make you know MIT better in that way. Um, and then now to be on the other side to hear about it from the administrative standpoint to say these are kind of the things that we think about. This is what we worry about. This is what we're excited about. Um, has been interesting. And then. You look at it from the corporation standpoint, uh, which is, you know, you're thinking about it not just what's happening today or tomorrow, but over the next five to ten years and what the imp implications are. Uh, and kind of just seeing that has been interesting, student life uh, specifically. Um, diversity is another one, right? How do you think about um, uh, making sure that everyone is comfortable, that everyone is thriving? Uh, and then to be able to see that MIT is making tremendous improvements, right? And you can see it happening. Uh, and as part of the corporation, you really get uh, into the nuts and bolts of, of kind of what that's happening, how that happens in real time. Um, and so, yeah, I've just found it to be really fascinating. Yeah. So to, to, uh, can you talk just about one particular instance where you know, you're, you're a recent grad of MIT, um, and you certainly immersed yourself uh, in the MIT experience. Uh, how has how 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 has that kind of played out in any particular way uh, when you find yourself um, advocating or presenting a certain point of view um, mm -hmm. among your fellow trustees? Yeah, I, I would say in some, especially as a recent graduate, what was interesting was when I came on the board. I think it is fair to say, I'm trying to remember who the chair was, but I think at that point, I was certainly the only engineering, the only engineering graduate student, the first one in 10 years, right, that had served on the board. And for most of the time, during my first year, like I was the only person who had that perspective. So I think the, I think the chair uh, who brought me on, I think may have been a Sloan uh, stu uh, master's student. But what happened was that perspective, when you talk about stipends, when you talk about health insurance, when you talk about research advisor advisee relationship, is a perspective which I think hadn't been represented in the recent graduates in 10 years. Mm -hmm. So when issues come up about students, it was very um, natural for me, again, one year previously being a student advocate, to be able to say, well, how are we thinking about this for graduate students, right? And when you're in a visiting committee, you can ask that question because it may not be the natural first thing that would come up. Not that people weren't concerned about it, not that people didn't worry about it. It's just that making sure that that um, perspective was represented and the questions were asked um, ended up, you know, was, was, I think, was helpful to the process. Now, later, a number of graduate students, actually the next three people who were elected after I was were also graduate students, engineers and scientists of various sorts. Um, but for that first year, I was the only one and had been for a decade. Uh, and so I think, you know, uh, just being able to ask and continue to ask those questions, I think, were helpful. Good. So talk about the uh, cyclical or symbiotic nature of your relationship with MIT, about how your work benefits um, your continued close involvement with MIT, and how your participation on MIT's governing board benefits from your work experiences. Mm. Yeah, I think one of the... Um, I think one of the big things, uh, so it actually in, ends up being two ways. One, I have a debt to this place that I don't know that I'll ever be able to repay. That's, I just start with that, right? So you use the word symbiosis. I, I don't know, you know, it, you know it, symbiosis implies a, you know, a, you know, that there's an equality of things that's happening. 
I don't know that I will ever be able to repay what MIT has given me. There's, I begin from that place. Um, that's why, you know, so I begin from that place. But what I think is true is because I have a consulting background and I have spent time in government um, and have a student, you know, and spent time as a student in student government, um, that what happens is when we are sitting in a visiting committee or we're sitting in um, CJAC, for example, which is a, uh, the, one of the committees that I chair, a lot of how I think about running processes and, you know, leveraging talented, um, uh, very talented, uh, being able to manage very talented people comes from my experiences in McKinsey, comes from my experience working, um, doing policy at the White House. Uh, because ultimately what CJAC is, for example, is a policy recommending body, right? So how do you get a good idea, package it in a way that it's um, understandable, actionable, and a lot of that comes from the fact that I have a consulting background and that's and, and, and a, and a policy-making background, which helps do that. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, because I'm an MIT-trained problem-solving person, um, when I am in government, there's a rigor um, that's very natural because as trained as an engineer, that's, that's how we solve problems, um, which I think is beneficial to uh, a consulting uh, kind of a, a experience or uh, a government one, where you don't have a lot of scientists that are represented. Scientists, are under, scientists and engineers are underrepresented in policy and government. Um, and I think, so there is that kind of back and forth which, which, which I think happens. So I, I, let's just jump back to New Orleans for a second, because yeah. there was a couple things I wanted to explore with you. First of all, um, it, what was it like for, well, for your family mm -hmm. uh, to have, uh, you know, to have you come back, you know, after being away, to have you come back, <laughs> You know, the, not the prodigal son, but to, to have you come back and to apply, you know, all that you have learned uh, to support the local community. Yeah, I, I think they were, they were, I think they were excited um, for me to be able to come back. Uh, the interesting thing is, uh, having grown up in Baton Rouge about an hour outside of New Orleans, I can now go to events. Oh, I'm graduating from high school, or oh, you know, I'm having a birthday. And so I could just hop in the car and drive and go and come back. I had Thanksgiving at my aunt. Um, my aunt, uh, my two aunts, they uh, cook every other year, so I actually got to go to that uh, in a, in a uh, town just outside of Baton Rouge. Uh, so just being able to reconnect with people that I, you know, it's much harder to uh, to travel, especially just being very busy with things. Um, so that's been great. My mom, who is in Florida, and my sister, um, nephews, one of my nephews is there. Uh, that's also easier to get to uh, from there. But I think, um, and also part of it is. <laughs> uh, my mom actually now uh, and my family all kind of understands what it is that I'm doing, right? Because before you try and explain, what's your, what's your research? You're doing, re what, you're doing research? Um, oh, you're doing consult, what do you consult? What, do you, what is McKinsey, right? What, what do they do, right? Like, what are you doing? But when I say, oh, I'm working in government, right? Or I, you know, I work for, I'm doing, you know, policy for, you know, for the White House. Oh, okay, I got, I can understand that, right? So to be doing that kind of work now, even through my consulting business, I'm helping governments work better, agencies work better. Now, your consulting business, so uh, to what degree were you, are you able to take advantage of um, kind of like um, um, MIT networking to call upon expertise to, to fill out your team? Mm. And actually, the, the, what's interesting is uh, a lot of times, even when I'm developing projects, they're doing um, business development, and I have to pitch uh, an idea or a, you know your in, uh, a potential client about work. Uh, I remember literally, I called um, a, a good friend of mine who um, you know who was a friend from GSC, and I said, and it was a broadband project, and I was like, well, this technical part of it, I don't you know, because he he does you know he that's his area. And so I was like, well, I'm trying to understand how to put this proposal together. How long do you think it would take a team to, to, to flesh this part of it out? Physically, how long would it take and what kind of resources would you need? And so he said, well, actually, it would do this. You need this, this, and this. Probably take about this much time. So I was able to revise the project um, and, and make it better that way. Also, uh, people that I have met either through directly through MIT or through other people at MIT have also been mentors to me. Two, uh, one of uh, my mentors um, in business when I started my company uh, is is a is a member of the corporation. Uh, I call her frequently um, about, uh, you know, I'm thinking about doing this. Is this? No, you don't want to do that. Yeah, don't do that. Or or you should do it this way, right? And because she's been doing it for 20 or 30 years, 
um, it's very helpful. And that's a connection that I made through, through the corporation. She's also an alum as well. And so, I mean, just tremendously helpful. And, and, and I wouldn't have, you know, and it just ended up happening that way. Yeah. So you're going to be involved in uh, corporation meetings for the next couple of days. And there is um, uh, a lot of excitement right now about upcoming uh, celebration of MIT's 100th anniversary. Um, moving from Boston to Cambridge and, and the upcoming campaign. But um, a, more broad, a broader question is what, what right now most excites you about the, the, the future of MIT mm -hmm. and, and, and what are um, any areas of concern? What, what, what can MIT do better? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really excited because, uh, you know, some of, the f f like some of the fundamental ways that MIT educates its students um, is, are being developed right now. Uh, and so what it looks like to learn and to live at MIT is going to be very different 10, 15 years from now. And though that kind of, the genesis of it is happening right now. Um, and to be on the corporation uh, at that time, uh, and we were on some of those supporting committees uh, to help with that work. I mean, it's, it's, it's really awesome to be a part of that. So I'm very excited about just what MIT is going to look like and how we educate. Just the, the, the future of education at MIT, there's a report that just came out about a year or two ago. Um, uh, I'm very excited to see how that eventually ends up being implemented. Uh, that's one thing. Um, I think the thing that, um, that I think about uh, that we just have to be vigilant uh, about is, is in the process of doing innovations, um, that we continue to make sure that we are um, true to our values. And I don't worry that we're going to stray from them. I just think that any time um, there's a huge change, you just have to make sure that, you know, in 15 years we're very different, but we're still the best um, at, at the things that we're good at uh, and the areas where we want to grow that we continue to do that. Like, I don't, I don't worry that we're not going to do it, but it's just something that I think we have to be vigilant about. Uh, and, at the, and we will, and we have good leadership uh, who are thinking about these things in the right way, I think. What can MIT do better? Well, I think one of the things, um, and again, my experience I think is, is uh, unusual in having gone from science, uh, or rather from science and engineering into government. Uh, but I think uh, MIT has produced great leaders in government, right? So Kofi Annan, um, who was the head of the UN, is, is, you know, um, uh, you know uh, a number of other uh, folks have gone into high government positions. I think students need to be aware of that um, you know, Shirley Jackson, right, uh, was very high up in Nuclear Regulatory Commission, he, very important. Um, I think that what MIT could do better is really just exposing students to that as an option, leadership in government and in policy development, whether it's in science-related things in government, for example, be, you know, uh, being the, the head of the NIH, right, as government service says a lot about the research um, and how that happens and what the direction of, of science uh, in, in health is going to be, right? That service, too, it's important. Uh, I think MIT can do a better job of really um, showing that as an option for students, that that's a way that they can also be of service. Because there's the service component, social entrepreneurship is huge, leadership in industry is huge. But I think having um, very effectively trained scientists and engineers in government, making policy about um, the future of our country and world, I think is critical. And speaking of leadership, going back to your uh, graduate years. Yes. One of the leadership positions you assumed at MIT was co-chair of the Black Graduate Student Association. Mm -hmm. Concerns around racial uh, insensitivity on college campuses have been in the news recently. Mm. And in your experience, how has MIT addressed these issues uh, back when you were a student and, and now? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, and, and that's a, a, a good question. I'm glad you asked it because uh, one of the things about MIT, just the character of this place, is that we tend to be very open and direct about addressing problems, right? You know, whether it's the uh, report on women in science when Chuck Best was president, we could have very easily just been quiet about that. But we said, not only is, is this a problem, but we're going to publicly say it, and then we're going to do something about it. And I think we did. Um, you're talking about issues of diversity, right? Um, the Michigan uh, case, right? Uh, I think it was about 10 years ago. Same thing. Um, you know, we filed an amicus brief saying that we are in support of using race as one of many um, uh, factors in admissions because it's important to have diversity in your student um, because that's a better educational experience. And so for me, MIT being very forward about these things, um, I think has, has been important to me. 
Uh, when I was a student, one of the most important moments that happened to me was when I was a first year. It was the end of my first semester. Uh, I'd come to MIT to get, you know, kind of, um, you know, thrashed academically and become tough because of it. And that happened in the first semester. Uh, but I remember going to an event called the Ebony Affair, which was sponsored by the Black Graduate Students Association. Um, and I remember standing there at the, at the beginning of it, and this is a, 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 an event that happens at Walker. MIT sponsors it, they give money for it. Uh, and a lot of administrators, uh, not only African-American ones and, and ones of African descent, but professors and administrators come to this thing every year. But as a, as a first year graduate student standing there and you know, Lift Every Voice, um, which is uh, you know, uh, considered the Black National Anthem, is playing to kind of kick this whole thing off. And I stood there um, literally with tears in my eyes, uh, inspired um, uh, by what was happening. Uh, and in that moment of support, uh, for me, I knew that it was going to be OK, right? that I was going to finish, that there were people who were with me, and that it was going to be fine. And that moment for me uh, was seminal in my experience at MIT because that ultimately led me to work as hard as I did when I was uh, co-chair of the Black Registered Student Association because I knew that that was going to be important, not only for, for African American students, but just for students in general, um, to, to be able to feel supported. At the same time, uh, very shortly after that, there was a, you know, a recognition. Chuck Vest, um, when he finished his tenure, said that you know, one of the things that he wanted to do more was to do diversity. Um, it was important for Susan Hockfield when she was president uh, to do more on diversity. Uh, I know that it's something that's important for Raphael. He spoke about it in his inaugural address, saying that um, you know, 10 years from now or, or some period from now, diversity is not an issue that we're discussing because it's something that we've already solved and it's in the past. One thing that I can say is that looking uh, at the data, uh, specifically in graduate students, we've probably uh, doubled, if not more, the last uh, the more the number of underrepresented minority students in uh, graduate students over the last, uh, you know, certainly ten, probably seven years, uh, and that trajectory continues to climb. Uh, I know that concentrated efforts are being made around um, uh, faculty as well and as well as women. So for me, you know. I feel like MIT, the, in my experience here, um, uh, is that there's a concerted, uh, heartfelt effort to deal with the issue. Now, everybody doesn't agree about what the right thing is, or what should be done, or what shouldn't be done, or whether there is an issue. You know, that's part of having a community, right? Um, but I think what is, is an honest conversation about what's happening, and we have made tangible, measurable progress um, since the time that I've been involved with MIT. And, you know, it's one of those things where I don't feel like, you know, I individually have been supported. And I know I have friends of mine who have had experiences where they felt less than supported. Um, but I feel like that's also true among um, underrepresented minorities as well as, as non-minority students here. Um, but I'm, you know, I feel very proud of the progress that we have made over time. Um, and I'm optimistic that we'll continue that way. Do underrepresented minorities uh, uh, on the graduate or undergraduate level um, come to you uh, and share with you uh, any of the concerns they have right now? I mean, do they? I haven't, um, not recently. Okay. Um, I think one of the things that I always think about is, um, you know, like who has an opportunity to excel and who, what, what the leadership looks like, mm -hmm. right? And just to give you an example, when I was a student, um, the chancellor was an African-American man. The dean for graduate students was an African-American man. Um, the associate dean for graduate students, Blanche Staten, who was also a mentor of mine, still is, uh, an African-American woman. Um, you know, the president of the graduate student council, me, I was African-American. The president of the UA, the same year that I was president, was Pius Uzamare, who was an African-American. So, my experience coming up, and I look around, and, and these are all you know, appointed and elected positions. I was elected by the Graduate Student um, Council to represent them. Pius was elected by the undergraduate uh, population to represent them. Um, and so for me, a lot of what the experience is around is who has an opportunity to excel, um, and, I don't, you know, and has an opportunity to have access. And, and, and granted, there are instances where um, you know, issues of race come up uh, which can negatively impact people. That happens everywhere. We're community. Um, but at the same time, I think by and large, the culture of this place is to say, if you're talented, we're going to support you. And everybody here is, you know, um, you know, by going through the rigors of getting admitted to this place. Um, and so I feel like the biggest thing around it is really around merit. Um, and I've, I've just seen that play out too many times to believe that it's not a part of the culture here.
Thank you. Thank you. So MIT is preparing to celebrate the 100th anniversary of moving across the river from Boston. Mm -hmm. The celebration tagline is celebrating a century in Cambridge. Mm. Can you talk about the importance of the MIT-Cambridge relationship both in terms of the past hundred years and looking forward. Mm, yeah, and I think, you know, that's one of the, the questions that comes up for every large university in a, in a, uh, in a you know, it's, it's so-called town-gown kind of relationship. Uh, I think, you know, one of the things that, that even when I was a student, we were keenly aware of, whether it's building a dormitory and what amenities go in and around it, um, is a relationship with the city. Um, I've, found out also that there are a number of MIT alums who are now on the city council uh, in Cambridge, no doubt, kind of as a, as a uh, result of their experiences as students and then wanting to, to, to stay involved. Uh, and so I think, um, you know, it's always important for the university and for the institute to be a good neighbor uh, to the city uh, because there is, I think, a symbiosis that happens there. But by virtue of the fact that MIT is located in Cambridge helps the city because they, you know, have this uh, infrastructure which is there and students which are coming through which that benefits the city but also um, you know the city of course is a benefit to, to us for those who you know want to live out and engage and and have a larger context outside of MIT uh, which is welcoming for us and so I think that relationship is, is important and has been for some time that's great um, so uh, thinking back now 17 years as you've said when you look around um, talk about the changes you've witnessed in your 17 years here yeah, there are a lot more dormitories, <laughs> at least on the graduate student side, uh, which I think, um, you know, changes the culture quite a bit. I think there are more student groups, uh, which also changes the culture quite a bit. Um, I think, you know, the sense that I get is uh, it was important then, but I think just the, the infrastructure around supporting students um, and their development, um, I think, has matured a lot. Not that it was immature before, it's just that there's more, you know, um, resources that are available to help students. I think, um, you know, the infrastructure around things like mental health uh, and the attention that it gets, I think, is uh, or have also um, uh, been increasing, especially, you know, in light of recent events. And so, um, you know, I think MIT is a, is 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 a growing place. I think it's evolving. Um, I think the student body is evolving quite a bit, both undergraduates and graduate students, uh, becoming more diverse, uh, which I think is, is, is good. And so I think just the educational experience here uh, is continuing to become more and more rich all the time, which what, I think it has been doing. And what about the surrounding area, the Kendall Square? And yeah, I mean, just, just <laughs> like every time I'm coming back and I keep seeing these new buildings, I'm like, what was there before? I don't remember it being there, right? And so. Right. Um, and also just having companies, I think I read somewhere recently that um, uh, that Kendall Square, uh, you know, is the most densely populated uh, uh, few blocks of innovation in the world, uh, just in terms of, you know, the, the uh, and so, and I think that's very exciting for, for companies that want to be here. It's good for students, it's just more opportunities. So uh, what advice would you give to an incoming MIT grad or graduate student today? Oh. Uh, the first thing that I would say is um, just create space um, to to really explore and to question um, what it is that you want to be um, in your life. Um, because whatever path you've been on for, you know, 22, 23, or however many years it's been, um, while you may have been the most awesome person ever, what I would strongly encourage any incoming uh, graduate student to do is to really just reflect on what it is that you really care about, what you're really passionate about, um, and to explore it and to, and to uh, have the courage to follow it. Um, because ultimately what happens is, you know, people who follow their passion, you know, with an experience like MIT but behind them can't help but be successful. Now, now you may have just answered this question, but I want to put it another way. Um, what advice do you wish was given to Eric Caulfield um, when he first arrived here that many years ago? Ooh. I don't know, because I, I, I feel like if, if I knew things and didn't have a chance to kind of figure them out or be surprised by them, they wouldn't have been impacted me the same way. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I can't think of anything that, um, you know, because part of it is if you'd known something, would you have done something different, right? And or at least is the implication. Uh, and I think for me, just like the, the path as, circuitous and you know start and stop as it was was part of the journey um, that I've just appreciated a lot and so good um, 
So how would you like to see your engagement with MIT uh, evolve, both in the short and the long term? So I, I would love to be, uh, continue to be on the corporation and, and to make contributions there. Um, and I think hopefully at some point I'll be able to make you know, larger monetary contributions. I'm a, I am a consistent giver uh, to MIT. Uh, I think I'm, I've, uh, you, know, that's, you get uh, after a certain mark of giving so many years in a row, you get a, a thing. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, but I hope to be able to, to grow that just because, again, I know um, that having more finances allows the, the institute to do more. Um, and I think that is uh, probably one thing. Um, and also just continue to be involved uh, either um, uh, with the Graduate Student Council, because oftentimes as, as former president, they've kind of created a, um, uh, a listserv which has all the former presidents on it. And so being able to be involved in, in that group to, uh, you know, to be of help to the graduate students, I think is helpful. Great. Yeah. And so how and where can um, Eric Caulfield uh, make the most difference, both in the near term and the long term? So I think um, for me, specifically in MIT or more broadly? Oh, just more, more, more broadly. Um, I, I think eventually uh, I hope to, to, to serve an elected office at some point um, uh, in the future. Uh, I think that will be in the probably medium to long term the thing that, that I, where I think I can be the most help. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to continue to be involved in my community. Um, I'm involved in a number of, of community groups in my neighborhood. I'm on the city's economic development board, a number of other uh, uh, local and regional boards, um, because I, I love New Orleans and I love Louisiana, and I just I feel like um, uh, there is good work to be done, and I want to be a part of that. Now, what do you do for fun? Are you still you still running marathons? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Did did you run Boston? I I, I finished the course, um, as they would call it. They say you run as a bandit, um, and so yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. But I did finish the course, um, and and ran ran uh, and, and finished it. Uh, that was fun. I still try to run when when I have time. Um, I love music. Uh, New Orleans is a great place for that. Um, you know, and uh, movies, uh, and actually, you know, now that I have a little bit more free time post. Uh, you know, a campaign, I can actually spend time going out with my friends and so. So to wrap up, I didn't want to, um, I wasn't going to, you have a long list of awards that you've uh, received over time, um, but um, uh, but I did want to just ask what, uh, what are a couple of the more special ones that you've, uh, that you've been given over time and, and why? Ooh. Um. You know, I mean, just recently you were given yeah. this, there was this gambit, 40 under 40. There was just, and there was also, you know, I talked about some of them, you know, the, the award you were giving is a, um, in recognition of the, your, your alumni relations. Yeah, I, th I think, um, I think the ones that probably um, were the, that probably meant, they all meant a lot to me, obviously. Um, but I think the, the Martin Luther King Jr. Award was one of the ones that was, there was MIT um, Award. Um, and that meant a lot, number one, just because I, like, I had no idea that I was even being considered for it until they called and, and told me. Um, but it was, it was specifically from, um, at least from the, the letter that they sent, uh, was because of the work that we did around funding graduate students and kind of setting up a way that an issue that had we've been dealing with for 20 or 30 years had then been solved because of the work that we did and lasted for more than a decade, or at least a decade. It wouldn't last for a decade, we didn't know at that point. But So that one meant a lot. Um, but also uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Lobdell Award, again from MIT, I didn't even realize I was being, you know, and then when they kind of listed out all the things that you do to, to get that, and I was like, well, I suppose that's true. Um, but it kind of goes back to something you said earlier. Um, for me, I, I mean, this place means a lot to me. And so when MIT calls and says, will you serve on this committee or will you be a part of this work? You know, I can probably count on half a hand the number of times that I physically wasn't able to say yes. And so whenever MIT calls, I'm gonna say yes. Um, and so that's just what I did. Not because, you know, I felt obligated, which I do, um, because I, again, I feel like I have a debt to play, a debt that I owe this place. But it's because I wanted to be a part of, of helping MIT. Uh, and so, if you know the, the institute wants to give an award for doing something that I like, I'm not going to argue with the wisdom of the selection committee. <laughs> um, but that one, I think those two meant um, 
meant quite a bit to me. And also, you know, there was a, a recent one that I, um, the Regional Institute, uh, Norley as they call it in New Orleans, uh, was um, recognized for outstanding contribution to uh, public service, and I was happy about that. So to wrap up, I, I do see uh, this trajectory that it's really interesting when you consider, um, you know, what you shared with me about, you know, first speaking, speaking publicly in church and then going to uh, Morehouse and, and MLK Jr.'s alma mater. And then you find yourself um, being awarded this at, this at this MLK celebration. We, you know, did you feel like you were channeling anybody? <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in some sense, um, you know, it, what's, what's interesting is a, a lot of, what, what is actually was very ironic is the person who gave that speech, I think the year before I did, was Chris Jones, uh, who was uh, BGSA co-chair the year before I was, who is also an alumnus of Morehouse. And, um, and so in some sense, and again, that speech uh, was kind of talking about the conditions as we saw them, and, and I think, um, it, yeah, it actually meant a lot to be able to, to kind of talk about it, but it was very consistent with a lot of the things that at Morehouse they taught us about, you know, if there's an issue that you think is important, your responsibility is to engage it and to speak about it. Um, and that was the preaching tradition, the ministerial tradition um, that I came uh, under or that I came through as, as part of Morehouse. And so to, to be able to, to speak at MIT's um, MLK celebration, one was just, a, it was a tremendous honor, number one, but to be able to, um, you know, to talk about issues that were important to me at that time, and they still are, um, meant a lot. And again, I think that goes back to, uh, you know, because I said, I think in the speech I talked about some things which, you know, kind of um, uh, spoke about some things, some areas where we can improve at MIT. And again, that goes back to one of the reasons why I respect Chuck Fest so much was because even after I had said, well, we can do better in these areas, um, instead of, you know, um, just letting it go, he got up and came and shook my hand as an affirmation that I too think these things are important. Terrific. Well, I, I, I do hope that you continue your very close involvement with MIT for oh, that, many, that is, many years I love this place. I, unless right. they, I don't think they've run me out of here yet. Yeah, so great, I, I great, hope to. Great. Thank you. Thank you.